What is up, Podheads? Back with another episode of the Podio Slay Podcast. My name is Tony. I'm joined, as always, by Anthony. And uh, we just had an epic conversation with somebody who has contributed to the podcast in the past, which was kind of cool when it came across our radar uh, to be able to talk to Nathaniel Shannon after using some of his photography in our episode cards was kind of awesome, right? I love when that happens, and I don't know if we've done that from a photographer front, but we have. We've had John Robbins on. We've had a few others. I love it when that happens. It kind of builds the family, right? It's we we love like most of the episode cards that you see on socials. Some of them we come up with, and you know, it, it's ripping off album art or something and putting our faces on it. But most of them are photographers that we either have existing relationships with, so there's a great pipeline there, or it's people we don't even know. It's a cold call. It's a IGDM. It's an email. Hey, can we use this? And everyone's been pretty good. Yeah, but Nathaniel, when did he come? He came in for the Damien, right? Damien Moyal episode. Yeah, our first Damien episode, which was, what, 79, I think? Uh, way back in the summer of 21, something like that. And it was... I think it was. Yeah, it was it was awesome that we were able to obviously f- find some cool photos and and this idea was your idea. I'm giving you full credit here. You were like, "Let's find photos of so and so uh, you know, on stage doing their thing and turn that into our ep card." And I was like, "That is amazing." And it brings more people in. We've used we've used Sean, of course. We've used uh, Steve Levy. Uh we've used a bunch of people over the course of, you know, 210 plus episodes and uh I think Nathaniel was one of the first ones that we did it that way. So really cool, really fun. Uh, he's got a book coming out in the very near future. The link in, is in the show notes about St. Vitus Bar in New York City. Yeah, it's, uh, and we've, we've seen it. It's, uh, yeah, St. Vitus Bar, the first 10 years in oral and visual history. The back half of this combo, we really kind of dig into it. But having seen it, it's stunning. It's gorgeous. It's probably one of the most visually pleasing books that i've ever looked at the photos are awesome which he had i don't know if he did all the the photography in it but he did i think most of it there's um commentary from bands if you've ever been to saint vitus you're in for a treat if you've never been to saint vitus in new york you're in for a treat like this is more than just a coffee table book this is something that it reads like a zine it the interviews are great the commentary from bands is great yeah and that that's the thing is when you bring in photographers in, in, into the patio slave world like they're creative people the the creative bounds are endless and nathaniel's a cool dude i'm glad we connected with nathaniel yeah and what you just said is perfect if you've been to the bar and you know the vibe and you know the shows that have gone you know come through that place it's for you if you're me who has never been to the bar but know of it by name and uh, we were able to look through the, the digital footprint of the book and see how awesome that place looks. And I mean, if you're fans of us, he has people from Killswitch. He has Damien from As Friends Rust in there. He's got uh, members of Thursday. We've had Tucker on a couple times. Anthrax, Calling Hours, Incendiary. Like, all those people have been on the podcast with us. They contribute. So, And they've played shows at Vitus. And, and uh, that place is, is quite the little hole-in-the-wall bar uh, in New York. 350 pages too so it, it just keeps going and and i mean i i read it i read the whole thing and i think two two sittings and it would have been one but i think um, other obligations got in the way but yeah if you like anything you've heard if after this episode you like what you hear there'll be a link in the show notes the book will be out if it's not already out it'll be out pretty soon there was a big kickstarter campaign a while ago and i think just the the final publishing and all that has to happen, but it should be coming out very soon or already out. So yeah, let's uh, let's get into our combo with Nathaniel Shannon. Nathaniel Shannon, welcome to the show. Happy to chat with you. How are you doing on this fine evening? Thanks for having me. Uh, I am still alive. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I think that that's Confirmed. a pretty, pretty good way to, you know, live life is by being alive. 
It's probably the best way to live life. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. See you guys. Yeah. We'll we'll chat next time. So we we chatted for a little bit before we started recording, but it, it's kind of one of these weird things where like we know you from the internet, so we we feel like we kind of know you already. Like there's some acquaintances, mutual acquaintances, we'll call them. Sure. But yeah, we first linked up, I think, via Instagram. We've used a few of your photos for uh, like our episode promo cards on this podcast, like the Damien episode. I think that was the link, really. Damien of As Friends Rust. So yeah, I don't know how you feel. Like, <laughs> are we internet friends? Is that where I'm going? Damien is like the shitty glue that holds together the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great yeah, point. Yeah, we're internet friends. We're real friends now. Now that right. I know, you know, what you look like. Yeah, yeah. We're uh, looking at a screen together. Exactly. Um, and, you know, someday we'll be able to do all this in person, but sure. it makes, the internet does allow us to do, to talk to people from everywhere, right? So Yeah, it's awesome. And to meet people via Instagram and then end up having conversations with them like this. So Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're, we're stoked to, to have you here. Uh, we're stoked for the stuff that you've got coming uh, and, you know, just generally to talk music with you tonight, man. Well, let's do it. When we got that link up from Damien, we uh, we start following you and just have followed all your photography and obviously shows at St. Vitus, but pretty much all over New York. Like I think I, I think you photographed Ministry last night. Did I see that? I did. Yeah. <laughs> so the real answer is how I'm doing. I'm feeling a little rough. <laughs> um, yeah. Because ironically, uh, like very old friend from Detroit, Jimmy Lucido who played in a band called Bang Bang in Detroit 20 fucking five years ago that I spent a lot of time shooting in my infancy is Gary Newman's drummer. So oh, I went wow. to go hang right. out with him and they've been, Gary's been out with ministry for, I don't like last year doing shows, which was awesome. And Gary Newman is like one of the nicest people I've ever met, which is cool that he's not an asshole it's always that's cool yeah yep. great when you meet people and they're not dicks uh he's great and like they have a really cool they have a really cool family on the road and and from what i was told ministry is kind of the same thing it's a lot of just people that have been with uncle al for a very long time i have seen and shot ministry a lot over the years i would say last night was probably one of the best ministry sets i've ever seen Right on. The information I was provided is that Uncle Al is like way into mushrooms. <laughs> so, and you can kind of tell because like all the colors were like very bright and it was just like way more psychedelic and like less, you know, crawling out of under a fucking dead car somewhere in <laughs> Texas to like get on stage and hide behind a fence. Does that change how you photograph like yeah. colors and shadows oh, and all that yeah. stuff? Yeah, like, I mean, we're, we're total novices in the photography game. One of my first of many rants I'm sure that I'll go off on tonight is growing up in a world where I shot film, 35 millimeter film, well, like for live music, everything was hot lights. So LEDs weren't implemented the same way digital photography wasn't Im implemented. And as digital cameras came out, the way that the sensor in the camera reads color is not the same way like film and celluloid reads color so now everything like every, everybody loves blue blue looks fucking cool it makes people look cool 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 tones i'm a big fan of cool tones and shooting cooler personally like in any color work i do but how that transcribes of what they call like the calvin scale which calvin is like how temperature is measured and color is measured is the cooler the tones like the more difficulty kind of like a digital sensor has to recognize that and you just get this like weird digital artifact uh i shoot a lot of black and white obviously digital cameras you have the option to right live in the future but like transferring or like moving from black and white or like converting files to black and white from color with a lot of blues uh it makes black and white just very muddy and gray and back when everything was hot lights which were more expensive and dangerous and like you could just do way less. I mean, like the technology, you know, it's like audio recording. Nothing beats real to real tape if you know what the fuck you're doing. However, you can also record cool songs on your phone. If you're a nerd about it and you know the difference and what to listen for as far as frequencies, digital artifacts, it's kind of all the same shit of nothing with 
LED lights, I think, is ever going to look as good as hot lights. But I also understand why and where the technology has gone, and you kind of have to adapt to that. And it's been, that's a struggle, because you just have to adapt to, like, where technology is at. I think I was a little more of a dickhead about it, like, years ago, of not wanting to change, yeah. but I, it's not up to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, right? not, I'm not the emperor <laughs> of cameras uh, or, or stage lighting. But it makes sense, you know? I mean, like if you, even in terms of, like, living in the New York City area, it's wild going to an arena like Madison Square Garden where you don't have these like massive PAs. You have something that is like a fraction of the size, but the audio quality is just like so superior that things change. So like LEDs are lighter. They're easier to set up. You have way more DMX control, like for, for a lighting tech, you know, at the board, you can just do more. You don't have to have like gels over, you know, old hot lights were just like a color. They'd be like white and you'd have to put gels over it. It's like, I just, it's kind of archaic technology. So there's, you know, a cause and effect relationship there that, you know, being stubborn, I didn't want to adapt with, but there's yeah. a long answer to your question. I love how nerdy this got right no, off the jump. Quick, like this it's, is, yeah. this it's is honestly what I signed something, up for. It's something that has driven me crazy for years uh, within shooting in rooms that have LED lights, you know, especially like small rooms like Vitus or Vitus or the only small yeah. room off the top of my head i can think of it it's it makes it harder and 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 different you know uh and i could really get into like the technical side of the stuff but i feel like we have a host of other topics that we can talk about and get nerdy about but um yeah you have to adapt with and it is i'm not going to say it hasn't been a, a struggle for me of having to kind of th change some gear like lenses faster lenses and that's all just kind of technical gear in, in, in math that you need to know, you know, you can pick up a guitar and make cool noises, mm -hmm. but like, can you play eruption? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, so you just played eruption. Tell us how you got to the point where you picked up the camera. You know what I mean? Like where you started, like, I like this. I want to start shooting things. Sure. Maybe it's bands. Maybe it's nature. Maybe it's whatever. How did you, how did you get to that point? I was really fucking bored in high school. We had one art class, or we, we had two art classes, which consisted of art one and art two, which I took six times. And by that, <laughs> like the sixth time, I had like become friends enough with the teacher. And I think the teacher is just like, just go, you like, go sit in the back. You can do whatever you want. There's actually like a storage closet and um, they set up just a table in there. And I just kind of got my own room that I could just go and fuck off and just do whatever. And I had a friend in high school who was going to take a photo class at the local community college in the town I grew up in, Ypsilanti, Michigan. There was a community college, Washington Community College, which unbeknownst to me at the time had this like really fucking incredible photography program. Incredible meaning like the equipment that they had like usurped what was at like University of Michigan, which is very expensive, like moderately prestigious but like it's a real college and i just was like man photography sounds like it could be cool i guess maybe i'll take this class with you uh because we we were allowed to like our senior year of high school do dual enrollment so i ended up taking like a night photography class which was cool because it's like i was 18 but I was in a class with like soccer moms and like 60 year olds, you know, cause it's right. just kind yeah. of like a general it's community college. So it's like anybody can go there. And I just, the first time I saw something like a, an image I shot come to life in the development tray in the dark room, I just got like fucking instantly hooked. And I've kind of always been ch chasing this dragon of like what that magic was. You know, it's like the first that's time. That's the coolest. That's the yeah. coolest shit. Anything you can latch on to something like that. Yeah, yeah, man. It's like you pick up a guitar the first time. You're like, oh, that's a chord or a, a note. Or I just made a drum beat on a table that wasn't shitty. You know, <laughs> like anything that you do yeah. where it's just like, oh, that's what art is. Like that, I, I'm satisfied with what I made versus just like throwing shit at a wall or you know never really figuring out necessarily like 
the steps to create other things that were in my head, it seemed like hilariously like a really easy medium compared to like illustration or painting or other things that like I was very interested in. But given the environment I grew up in, I, I just didn't really have access to like a better education of. And um, pretty quickly it dawned on me like, oh, I should just take this camera rather than taking pictures of like my friends in high school trying to drink gallons of milk in an hour and then throwing up everywhere. <laughs> wow, I should can relate. Take this. We did do that. We did that too. Yeah, there, there, there's a video. Did. So of course you did. <laughs> Rather than just taking pictures of that, like I should just take this to go to a show and like take pictures of bands. And, you know, simultaneously at the same time, I was getting into um, kind of what was going on locally, music wise. I had some friends that were in this like very ween influenced band who were kind of whatever, but they um, used to play with this band called Cobra Youth all the time from Ann Arbor, Michigan, who were like a G.I. Joe themed punk rock band. Nice. There's been a few of those. There was a, wasn't Rambo, that same thing? Rambo. And, actually, I think there was a band from Portland named Cobra. That doesn't surprise Thank you, right? me. Yeah. I think um, G.I. Joe had a big impact on a lot of us. Yes, he did. But I, I started going to those shows and taking pictures of those. And then I went to see Cobra Youth one night at the Cobra Youth house, which is the house that they all lived in. And there's a band, uh, that were called the oven mitts that played and the oven mitts ended up producing jeff tuttle who went on to be more most notable for playing guitar and dillinger escape plan for a while he was in this band the oven mitts turned in capsule flag it was um what i loved of fat records but with like dudes ripping a rip <laughs> erections <laughs> dudes ripping erections it was dudes he was <laughs> ripping <at> <laughs> He was ripping, uh, you can leave that in there. He was ripping uh. eruption solos, but like over these like kind of like lag wagon -y, strung out propaganda type songs. And it just fucking blew my mind that like there was this dude that could like play who seemed like he was my age and I could take pictures of him. And I've been following Jeff around for like the last 25 years. And like, so to watch him go from this basement show that like absolutely changed my life in terms of getting me into what was happening in my town but then to like go on tour with him and photograph dillinger you know just just self-destruction and fan destruction over like the last 25 years it's like that can kind of you know i would have never known that day i walked into that house that i'd be like fuck man that dude you know thanks jeff that's all it takes well, what I was thinking of is probably before then, you're probably taking photos of maybe like images that are still or like mm -hmm. a, a landscape that's still where a show, it's a moving target. That's yep. a whole layer of complexity that I don't know that I've ever even thought about until now. You know, what was interesting is at that time in one of the like very fundamental or rudimentary photo classes I had, we had to do series about motion and like what's called like shutter drag so like if you're running back and forth or a band's moving around you know you can through the equations that is camera settings at least shooting film you can get your target in focus moving and then everything else around it kind of blurs and that's not at least shooting film the easiest thing to do unless you know what the fuck you're doing it takes a lot of practice so yeah, you're totally right. It's a it's a moving target and it's very organic and chaotic. And I think I got drawn to that very, 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 very quickly of being a little bit of an introvert, especially when I was younger and shy, that like it wasn't like, hey, Tony and Tony, all right, so this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna direct you. I don't need to direct you because you're just gonna explode in front of me and I'm there to like learn you. You know, so for, for somebody with Jeff or a million of the bands I've spent like the last 25 years shooting, it's like, I know what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. Like, I know, okay, here's the bridge into this part of the song. That motherfucker is going to jump right here or this thing's going to happen. And it's, it's, you can kind of anticipate that energy. You know, I, a couple of years ago when the pandemic happened and, and George Floyd 
got murdered and things went like all hell broke loose in Brooklyn. I spent a lot of time in the streets shooting the protests and this sounds really weird and this by no means has like a political connotation, but it reminded me of like how I first fell in love with just documenting this yep. chaotic, organic explosion. Unscripted. Just unscripted happening. and you can feel it you can feel the energy you can feel the energy in the protests i mean there was some gnarly shit of like the nypd fucking attacking motherfuckers and like you could feel it before it happened the same way like you go watch a band like dylan Tripp play you know I, i'll just keep using them as an example but like you know and you can kind of anticipate that coming so to know okay, what are my camera settings? What is the lighting as we were just discussing? Is it LED lighting? Is it hot light? You know, so I know when that dude jumps or like this thing pops off, I will be there to get that image that nobody else is going to get. Yeah, you're ready. You're already yeah already available and, and have everything set the way you need to, to. Yeah, that's cool. And that's kind of, you know, a skill. You can't teach that. I can teach you how to use a camera. I can teach you right. all totally. about lighting. I totally. can teach you how to walk into any environment and not even have to look or take like meter readings of settings. Just know kind of ballpark what is going to be a good exposure. I can teach you all of that. That shit is easy. I cannot teach you how to interact with anything that happens around you. That is just a learn That's skill. innate, right? That's something mm -hmm. that you... You see a bunch of it. You, it's the 10,000 hours that we always talk about. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. You've been in front of a lot of these. You can tell when something's going to happen. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So early on, drawn to it. And, and I know that feeling, not from a photographer's perspective, sure. but from going to your first basement show, going mm -hmm. to the first, you know, whatever show. And you're like, there's an element of, I'm not supposed to, am I supposed to be here? It's like an element of, <laughs> sometimes an element of danger, but it's like this newness that just, fucking hooks you and yeah. you know here we are 25 years later still hook so i can relate to that how how many shows have you filmed or shot is that because like i'm just thinking from you said you mentioned the garden earlier you mentioned you know obviously vitus yeah. like there's so many changing variables that mm -hmm. you have to put in those hours i'm just curious how many i throughout the course of the last year have slowly been reorganizing my entire archive from like all of my film to digital um, spreadsheets, alphabetized by year, whatever. I'm oh, going to die. I'm, I'm, I'm nerding out right now. You know, I'm going to die at some point. We're all going to die at some point. I have kids, probably won't have kids. Uh, somebody will end up having to deal with my bullshit or they'll just throw it away and I'll disappear. <laughs> Who knows? I don't care. I'm going to be dead. But like for my own neuroses of organization and having lost things over the years, I've been putting all this stuff in a spreadsheet. So I have like a, a rough number, but it's probably close to like 1300. Wow. Yeah, I believe shows, it. Totally believe it. Uh, between film and, and digital, like over the last 25 years, which seems like a lot. The way that like I remember things versus like seeing a number a spreadsheet of like, oh man, it's, Fucking, what do you got up there? Hate breed or the Deftones, or Queens of the Stone Age at wherever this year. It seems like it would be way more than that. Because in my head, I was like, man, I, there is years where it's like I did this four or five nights a week for like years. The thirteen hundred ish kind of just doesn't seem like it's that much. Oh, but it is, and and every <laughs> one of them, <laughs> every one of those nights probably has, you know six different memories or eight mm -hmm. different vivid memories of things that happened, like getting there, getting set up, seeing the band go on, all that stuff. I mean, that's the reason we started this podcast is to to talk all that shit from the last 20, 25 years for us, like yeah, seeing sure. those bands and, and, and maybe even talking to them at some point, which we've been able to do. So I, I it, when you reduce it to the number on the screen, it feels like less than it yeah. is, but we know, we all know it's not, it's way more than that. Yeah. And the reason I bring all that up is, it's just like getting back to the 10,000 hours. Like you cannot fake that. You can't, there's, no. there's certain lightings that you could, you know, be taught at a community college that you'd never know what to do until you're in the moment. There's parts of songs that you'd have to, you know, either over the band or listen to a band or watch, you know, so much YouTube uh, live footage to know. 
and it's just it's amazing and like we we have some photographer friends and what they do is amazing and you kind of take it for granted i do like as someone who's been to maybe half the amount of shows you do you get so satisfied with like just seeing the photos that they took the literal next day of the show and you soak it in but you don't realize how much skill and how much precision and it's not just snap 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 yeah i i agree you bring up a really good point of of skill you know it's it's within all of that within those 10,000 hours within those 1300 shows you develop style and right on yeah i was having a conversation recently with like a former mentor of mine who teaches um photography still a uh, very accomplished portrait photographer and he had just hit up a bunch of people and was like how do you feel like you developed your style behind a camera over the years and i wrote him back and was just like repetition right on yeah. repetition failure and then every now and then you get those little successes of there are certain I remember very specific, I had lived in Georgia for a while, like 45 years ago. And there was a band from Athens, Georgia called Music Hates You that were like very much just, I hate God. And um, there was a picture I took of their singer with a little bit of flash, like a little bit of fill, a little bit of a shutter drag. And like the motion that that picture ended up catch capturing of this person i was like that that's it i want to chase that i want to follow that how do i do that more you know and it was like a little happy accident but like those happy accidents you figure out you can backtrack and be like oh okay well what was i doing where was i standing what were they doing how what was the lighting light what was the crowd like what did i eat that day did i take a shit how much did i drink like all of these variables that go into just doing literally anything what did you guys eat for dinner tonight did you go to the bathroom did you make sure to take a break and go to the bathroom before this? You to talk to somebody, you know, all of those things affect what you do uh, creatively or um, your day job, your interactions with your friends. You know, how often do you run into somebody that you haven't seen forever and you start talking and you're like, fuck, bad pee. fuck I want to talk to you more, but I got to pee. And I know right. if I walk away, like I'm not going to, you're going to walk away, you know. So being ready again, as you said, to like, be right there and ready and i miss that mark all the fucking time like all the time everybody and does I, yeah yeah um and it's something like i just i pull rookie mistakes constantly where i'm like fuck man i've been doing this for so long i should have known better i shot danny brown last saturday at irving plaza new york very corporate live nation lots of rules there's lots of rules fucking everywhere which kind of ruins part of the fun of just being able to run around with the camera and do what I, I, I do. And uh, I was like, well, it's Irving Plaza, it's Live Nation. Like, I can't shoot with flash. I'm going to bring three bring three cameras and a bunch of lenses because I know what the lighting is going to be like. I've spent like years and decades in that room, yada, yada, yada. And I get there and security's like, yeah, man, uh, you know, use flash no limit you stay up here as long as you want and i was like what the fuck are you guys talking about that's not that's not corporate live nation rules and i didn't bring a flash and i was like what a fucking rookie ass mistake of i always have that with me just in case i never know what's gonna happen so you know it's like you leave your house without the spare tire it's like ah, i'm just going to the grocery store and and then you need to happen and And then then i need it and i'm like yeah, my pictures are fine, but the entire time I was like, God damn it, dude. I know that I could have shot this like a punk rock show rather than a corporate, sterile, three songs and out, kind of boring Live Nation show that I had already in my head solidified was going to be the experience. And then they were like, yeah, man, do whatever you want. And that happens sometimes. I shot a really good friend's wedding once and forgot all my memory cards. And I had to borrow Whoa. them from kind of an arch nemesis in the music community. <laughs> I knew he had memory cards and that mutual friend was like, I'm going to call that dude, get, get the memory cards for you. And like having to like eat my own shit and just be like, yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks man. Cause I'm an idiot. <laughs> like <laughs> flew home to go shoot like one of my best friend's weddings. <laughs> God damn it. But I mean, that's, we're all human and that shit happens. Yeah, so, sure. yeah you're going to make sure, mistakes sure. here and there, even if you're a seasoned pro, like, I, I mean, Ant- 
Anthony just had mute on. So. <laughs> yeah, Anthony <laughs> fucking muted. That was like forget I flashes. I, I ruined the episode. Or, uh, I ruined. I get. I get to leave, guys. Sorry. Forget memory cards for your friend's wedding. You know, but it's it's also hard. I think I think it's gotten harder over the years for me to just be like ah, you know, whatever. I'm human. And not beat myself up over the fact that it's like you should fucking know better, dude. You have right. been doing this for too long to make some rookie ass mistakes, you know. So, my bad. So, th- I'm curious. Thirteen hundred shows, hundreds and hundreds of them were at St. Vitus. That's another thing. Like when I sat down to start working on this book and go through my own work, it was another like I feel like I've shot thousands of shows in this room and it really was like the number was like considerably smaller like under a hundred wow that i was like man for 10 years like for real no i definitely shot more than that it's just a matter of like well what were those shows some of those shows were very very cool so you know eight not so great shows make up for the fact that like obituary played and i was there Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's awesome so how did you link up with uh, St. Vitus? I knew Artie a little bit from just being around, and I was, I was a really big fan of his band Gay for Johnny Depp, which I still think <laughs> is the best band he's ever been in, which Artie will disagree, but fuck Artie. I love him, but I think that that's, that band's the best. I was a big fan. I used to kind of hang out at the bar that he and other owner George worked at Matchless in, in Brooklyn. And um, the talent buyer, what became the talent buyer, Dave Castillo, was an acquaintance that he and uh, his friend Fred Bakita kind of had this thing. It was like Brooklyn Vegan, but not lame, um, that catered more towards aggressive music. Right on. But yeah. at the same time, we also all fucking love High Rod Circuit. So, like, oh, okay. it was You're just kind company. of like what you know we love rap and we love metal and 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 electronic music you know it's like pigeonholing yourself is like one spot for one specific thing you just turn into like the new york post of whatever your blog is your whatever your website is anyway so i had met those dudes on the train going to a converge show uh and they <laughs> handed me a flyer for a show that they had booked and it turns out we all went to the same show and like we got hammered and shot Converge and it was great. They were still putting out good music and we became friends and I started shooting for their website, Chronic Youth, pretty consistently. So when Fidus came along, Dave ended up starting to book there and I just started hanging out there all the time as a patron and just kind of friend. And they, I think very early on, realized utilizing other people's skills within the music, I say in quotes, music community of, of Brooklyn, that it was just like, yeah, man, you just kind of have a free pass to come here and shoot whatever you want because that's great. You're yeah. documenting this thing that happens. And there's been a host of us over the years, myself, um, Torsten Mayer, who used to shoot a lot of the video there before Frank Quang came along. Uh, for those of people out there who don't know Frank's name, Frank has shot literally every video from St. Vitus you've ever seen because he's extremely obsessive compulsive about documenting everything. And that motherfucker lives in that bar every night. He lives in the basement. Yeah. He lives in the basement basement under Mm -hmm. a pile of boxes. They (laughs) made a little nest for him and he snuggles up tight every night with a bunch of empty beer cans. And you know, they, the smartest thing that bar ever did was to paint the logo on that back wall. Because between Frank's videos, my photos, everybody that's shot there, everybody that's taking a cell phone video, anybody that's ever Mm -hmm. made an ocular document of that room, that branding is in the back behind whoever's playing, whether it's like fucking Megadeth or Skull Shitter, who is Rob, one of the sound guys. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, if you're in Skull Shitter there's a logo if you like megadeth still that logo's there and (laughs) i don't know that they like sat down had a meeting and was like yeah we need to give opportunities to people as much it was just like yeah man you're here all the time just 
hit us up we'll we'll let you in and that relationship just developed and strengthened over the years as did their business as did their booking some of the wild underplays that they had come through and you know the rec- global recognition outside of you know the nirvana thing happening in in the descendants playing and carcass and megadeth and anthrax and like these big shows were again that logo is now fucking everywhere and it was like free oh, yeah. pass in a way that you can't ask or pay for the exposure back to the exposure that we all get paid in, that they've gotten simply by everybody taking a picture or a video and that shit being in the background so that relationship just developed over the years and like they became really good friends i ended up bartending there for for a handful of years before the pandemic and i just kind of was always there because for a while there was nothing else there was really Mm. nowhere catering towards i don't want to say aggressive music i think one of the the strongest things besides the branding that the, the, has made that bar so successful over the years was like already played in era type 11, you know? So you've got the more sensitive side of revelation records on top of like, Oh, judges, oh, right. Right. you know, on top of there's questionable black metal bands that are playing the got book that somebody on the internet gets mad about. And then and there's like the goth dance parties and then there's this thing and this thing, and it isn't just like fucking metal. It's not just battle jackets and ball sweat like every night. You know, it's, it's, we all, they all love, we all love like so many different genres of music outside of country, which would absolutely ring up high bar sales, but you just don't want to fucking deal with the, the headache and bullshit of those crowds. Like they've catered to like everybody in all, all scenes. So again, to not like pigeonhole yourself and just be like, no, it's just metal. That also just gets kind of fucking redundant. And you shoot yourself in the foot, not only as a business, but like as a fan. And and that's lended to like a very diverse palette. You know, so even when I started working on this book, I was like, I don't want it to just be, and this will probably bum some people out, of like, it's not all metal. Like Sam I Am played one of the coolest shows I've ever seen there the week after hurricane sandy and there's maybe like 15 or 20 people at that show and they came and somehow got into the city and still played and it was awesome because it was just like oh they're just playing a basement show this is just a bunch of friends hanging out who got basically stranded in the neighborhood where the bar was and like could make it there that show was as cool to me as watching carcass play who i love equally in a different direction the reputation of the bar and the venue, it permeated. I mean, we're two dudes from Southern Maine, you know, I don't know how many miles that is, but like we've known about Vitus for, I don't know about a decade, but pretty close sure. to it. You know what I mean? Yes. It was in my eyes, it was, it filled the gap that CB's left. Yeah. And sure. I always wanted to get there. And I did. Well, I got there in November for the As Friends Rush show. Oh, right. I went, I went down. Did we meet at that? We didn't. I, I saw okay. you there, and it was one of those things. It's like, I know who he is, but I don't think he has any idea who the fuck I am. So I'm going to just not blame, engage him. You can blame Damien for that. <laughs> yeah. fucking dick. He's the, what do you say? He's the shitty glue that the shitty glue the internet. internet. Yeah, yeah, he holds the internet together, not like in person stuff. <laughs> right, he's, right. He's yeah. fucking You should have just DM'd him from the, from the crowd, Twan. That's what you should have done. <laughs> we should call him right now and just yell at him and be like, you're a fucking asshole. Why don't you? Oh, we'd go for three hours if we had Damien back. We've done that a few times with him. <laughs> yeah, the three hour special. But like it, it had a reputation. It had a vibe. It, it catered to, and you, you nailed it earlier. Like you like Hot Rod Circuit. You like Carcass. Like that's us. Like I, sure. anything that scratches an itch for me and Vitus has a vibe. It has a, you know, it just, I can see what drew you in. Without even ever having gone there until last November, I can totally understand what what drew you in. And sadly, we don't have anything really like that up in Maine. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing like that. You've got Steve Austin's cabin. You've got the Today yeah. is the Day house. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Have you been up to Maine? Uh, I've been to Steve's house a couple of years ago. We went up when um, William Saunders and I were working on the Dead Guy documentary. We went up to film Steve and hung out with him for the day. 
at his house and it was awesome because he's a very old friend and a fantastic dude so to like be at the house where like all of these classic records to me got recorded at was just like this is it you literally like fucking set bands up in your living room and you have like your little control room it was cool uh that's the only time i've ever actually been to maine i take it back we have genos genos rock club is the yep. closest thing which I have seen on the internet. But yeah, it's a vibe. It's, it, it, it's like the last of the dying, sure. dying breed. Yeah, we had a lot of that stuff in the night. I think we had more of those places in the 90s when we were kids that right. no longer exist, unfortunately. But Gino's is still there. Yep. Yeah. I want to I wanna dig into the book. But yeah, before sure. that, like, what, what is it to shoot at Vitus? Because, like, I've seen countless videos on the web. I've been there for one show. And it's very active. Like there's, there's a lot going on. It's a small room. I think what's the cap? Two fifty, two hundred, two fifty is two fifty. So it's average. You know, it's got sweaty. Sold out it's there's not a lot of room for you to move around, like to film or to to snap. So like, what is it like to to shoot shows there? It's stressful. It's stressful because <laughs> I'm forty two, and getting punched in the face is not as much fun as it used to be. <laughs> was it ever fun though? Was it ever really? There was a time in my life where, like, being part of violent situations was more stimulating. I'm not going to lie and pretend like it's not still stimulating. Of course, it's stimulating. But, like, I don't, the anxiety of who am I going to have to deal with Sure, is not fun the way it used to be. You know, another jaded camera guy rant is 25 years ago, if you had a camera, you probably knew what you were doing and there was like two maybe three yeah. people yeah. shooting now there's like fucking 45 and it's just kind of overkill i say uh, side note like i shot king diamond at the king's theater in in brooklyn a couple of years ago and i shot king diamond a bunch of times one of my favorite bands ever it was always exciting and i got up photo barricade standing there it's like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, <laughs> sixteen, seventeen, wow. eighteen, nineteen people with cameras. No way. It's like that's that's like seventeen people trying to get <laughs> yeah, up here. It's, it's too many. And yeah. as much as I want to be a dick and just be like, get the fuck out of like wh what right do you have? I would never say that. Everybody has a right to do that. Sure. Everybody has a right. I kind of actually as much as I love the barricade, because it gives me the freedom to do whatever I want, unfortunately, as much as I would love life to be about me, it's not. So anybody should be able to bring a camera and shoot anything all the time. I think photo passes are fucking stupid. However, there's like, you know, the teeter totter of, let's say privilege, but like credentials that I kind of question, like, how, like, how many. 19 18 people what are you like what are you shooting for because now you're just kind of in your way and impeding my ability uh i'm pretty aggressive in that environment because i've been doing this long enough that i know when i need to be aggressive even though i don't seek out being aggressive so if there's 10 people with cameras at a show at vitus i promise this has a point there's 10 people up front out of 250 people there's 240 people who now have to deal with those 10 people being in their fucking way and that's annoying for bands it's annoying for fans i respect both sides of that and like i don't want to be in the way and i don't want to be part of that 10 people who then is then getting looked at as being kind of a hindrance so there's that angle of dealing with that like which is like slightly competitive it's also I'm a little more polite and cautious of my surroundings of of not trying to bum out other people. Like I don't want to stand and I'm six two, not super tall, but I'm tall enough that like if you're at average height at a show is like yeah, you throw camera gear me, on top of that. Like, yeah, I'm in your way, you know. So like I kind of even at a place like Vitus, I keep kind of keep my own ethical rule of like three songs and out, just because I don't want to like ruin anybody else's good time that being said i'm also there to get a job done and i do my job and then i i leave but like that's led to a lot of aggressive situations over the years which 
I partially understand. Like, it's kind of a nuisance having that many people. I went to the Gulch, did their last tour uh, a couple years ago, who I think were probably one of the cooler bands of the last decade that, like, really yeah. brought something yeah, refreshive to that style of hardcore. I've been at a barbecue all day. I was humming and hawing about even going. And I was like, man, I'm not even, oh, I know, I know what it was. I had texted Frank Quang video overlord of St. Vitus. And I was like, how many people are there with cameras right now? And he was just <laughs> like, dude, there are no shit. Like so many people on stage, which yeah. that stage can barely fit a band shooting. And I was like, cool. I'm just going to come watch the show. Like I don't have, even I have this compulsion that I have to be the best one competitive nature of getting pictures of everything. I'm not going to come and watch, man. I just want to watch this band play and I want to watch them punch kids in the face and I want to watch kids punch each other in the face. I don't yeah. want to worry about getting punched in the face. I just want to go like be an observer for once. And I got there and I have the um, elite benefit of being able to stand behind the soundboard. And I did. And I watched a bunch of kids punch each other in the face and it was great. And there was 20 people in that room shooting that show and i was like dude that is wow. unnecessary it's crazy yeah one out of every 20 people were uh <laughs> so for an example like that and like there's no again no disrespect to those 20 people but like if you're a fan watching somebody play like that becomes kind of a distraction yeah. after a while oh, so there's like this this kind of ethical median that i have of like not being disruptive but also, I don't give a fuck if I'm disrupting you because I'm here to do my job, but I'm going to do it and get out, you know? So what is it like? It's stressful. I used to not give a shit. I just bulldozed my way in there and, like, didn't take other people's feelings into consideration. And, and uh, that led to me getting into some physical altercations over the years, which is a kind of par for the course. But, like, you know, th that's no different if you were shooting protests or... Fuck, man, uh, one of the one of the things I remember years ago watching a documentary, which I recommend everybody watching, which was called The War Photographer with James Nakway. James Nakway shot fucking war. And like it gave me the perspective of there is nothing I do in my life that will ever mean anything. Right. Because yeah. <laughs> At the end that of the is day, I totally get you. the, the ultimate document document of how fractured and fragile and broken humanity can be and the addiction that comes with that of being in those environments and like listening to him talk about it i was like i like taking pictures of dudes that rip guitar real fast <laughs> so it's like yeah. stimulating yeah. but like who gives a shit man right uh, perspective yeah that perspective you know and like i think about that constantly when i go into these situations and what i come back to is like well if I've already talked myself out of being there and I go, I have to just go do it because then I'm going to leave and be like, man, I should have taken pictures of that. And I know, you know, I recognize like that's all in my head. Like that's not totally. Yeah. That's oh, not yeah. anything but me versus me, which has been a struggle over the years, you know, like straight up, like real talk of like my own mental stability. And I have like no problem talking about that. It's like, it causes anxiety for me. And it's been a struggle over the years of like, getting that little spark of motivation to just be like, oh, all right, man. Sometimes crowds are really cool. People are really cool. Security is really cool. And then other times when it's not, it's like, fuck, man, I have to deal with this again. I have to deal with some dude who like, I don't, you know, or a lady that maybe they're having a bad day and this is their escape. And now I'm somehow involved in ruining their escape from life. And like, they're going to attack me. I remember years ago being at Bowery Ballroom, shoot, Manor Astro Man, a bunch of motherfuckers that dress up like in spacesuits playing space <laughs> surf, uh, who I love. And this woman straight up attacked me. I had a very long wow. beard at the time and long hair, and I was taking pictures. It was full, but it wasn't like particularly that crowded. And this woman just attacked me and crawled up on stage and dove at me and tried to tackle me, like swinging. And security oh, grabbed her Jesus. and like kicked her out. And everybody around me was kind of like, what is going on? And I remember there was a gentleman standing next to me that kind of like grabbed me and kind of helped me. And I was like, did I do something? And he was like, no, like absolutely not. Wow. 
I don't know what you guys do for work, but it's like sitting in traffic of like, what, what is the stressed out person going to do in rush hour right now? What is, if I just go to get a coffee somewhere, is like somebody going to flip out in public and like, you know, yeah. again, some of that's just in my head, but it's partially like people are fucking crazy. Yeah. Well, oh, people especially are especially definitely crazy around aggressive <laughs> music, you know? Well, yeah, you, you're adding fuel to a fire that's probably already there for some of those folks. Yeah, and then sure. booze is another one of those accelerants. So 100%. yeah, t- toss all that stuff in there. Booze or any other substances. Um, but yeah, totally. But I also love it at the yeah. same time, right. and, you know. <laughs> well, that's why we're all here, right? We all, we all love this stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, you're kind of championing, championing an environment. You know, you brought up ministry. Yeah, I had all access pass. I could spend as much time as I, I wanted up there, which was awesome as like a kind of pat on the, the back of like years of work. And that's cool. But I also think like, what if ministry played at Vitus? What would that crowd an experience for me just trying to get mm. some like, like a handful, you know, if I can get like three solid shots, like that's a win and an accomplishment. What would that crowd be like in reaction be like at Vitus, not at Terminal 5, which is like a massive venue with a barricade, safety and security, and blah, you know. Just a whole different vibe. It's a whole different yeah. vibe. But what, what would my pictures look like? They'd be drastically different. Yeah. Well, you mentioned like the whole thing is, you know, it's, it, it, it can get you to cause, it cause anxiety. It's, it's, it's a war out there. I'll say this, though. Uh, from a consumer of your art, the end product is gorgeous. And oh, thanks. the book, St. Vitus Bar, first 10 years, oral history, uh, an oral and visual history, you sent us a digital copy of it. And I'm not blowing smoke, my friend. It's fucking gorgeous. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, thanks. It's, I mean, it, it, it's one of those things that, like, you wouldn't think you could make a claim like that without tangibly having it. But the digital is like, like, I have to have it. Like, I, I need to have it. And it's not, it's 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 because of all the ingredients. It's It's all the bands I love. It's a place that I've gone to that I love. But the way it's presented, it's like, I don't know, go, go buy it and we'll, you know, get into the details of how you can get it. But when did you transition to like, all right, let's, let's actually do something with all this art, sure. all these visuals that I've created in, in all these experiences. Like, when does that happen? Because the book chronicles the first 10 years, which is what year is that? 20, it's all 2011 to, to, 11. to okay. ostensibly. 2020 like the last show that the bar had was human impact which is one of chris spencer from unsane spans and that's where the book oh, ends nice. yeah. and <laughs> pros and cons of the situation of making the book and where to end it was pandemic great cutoff yeah the whole project kind of started years ago as i was working there and um even before I started working there, I had suggested that they, let me skip around here. So in the back room, they used to have a bunch of my old roommate, Jay Morris's flyers up around um, the top of the soundproofing. And he had designed show posters for the, for the bar for years and years and years. So they had like a cool collection of his work. And I was like, let's do something in the front bar. Like I'll just curate and by curate, I'm going to just make it all my work of let's hang a bunch of my stuff up in there. Cause like, why not? You know, there's so much other like ephemera and, and bullshit and pe- stuff people have donated and signed records by whoever has played there. Let's showcase some cool stuff that has happened in the bar. So we did a couple versions of that, of me swapping workout and, and including a handful of other people, specifically um, Keith Marlowe and Samantha Marble who are good friends of mine and of the bar that have really, really strong work of the place over the years. And we did that. I was bartending and I would stare at my own work every night. And I was like, why don't we take this a step further beyond like my work? There's so many talented people that hang out at that place, whether they're designers or painters or sculptors or yada, 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 that living in a city that is so fucking expensive and shitty and hard to do anything let alone get wall space that isn't like hey tonight only yet you know tommy's fucking tommy's clam bar and cocktail lounge 
we're having uh, Tony and Tony's. <laughs> too many Tonys. Way pod, too many Tonys. Podcast flyer show. Just mm-hmm. one night, though. We can do you that. Know, so do it after that. Yeah. Like, th- three hours. Open bar. Like, that shit sucks, because it takes so much work. Even if it's like me, okay, I'm printing 10 photos and framing them. Like, that requires work for, like, one night. That doesn't seem worth it. So I had been talking with the owners about, like, why don't we try doing Vitus Presents gallery show somewhere where we can work with a local gallery, which there's a bunch of warehouse spaces that kind of did longer term event installation type things that were also in a proximity walking distance of the bar where it's like we could have an opening party, do after party at the bar or something. And we had kind of squared it away and decided on a, a place a couple blocks away uh that was in february of 2020 and then right yeah everything and then we all happened. know what happens next then we yeah. all know what happens next and you know as i've done press for the book and what i'm about to say the irony of this global th- event happening is i feel like people had two experiences it was either fucking terrible stressful based on like their personal responsibilities, politics, finances, or you're like your boy Nathaniel here, who had like the most fun he's ever had. Because in my late 30s, I was like, oh, this is what being retired is like. I can just wake up every day (laughs) and be like, hey, man, I have this idea where I'm going to paint like aliens finger in their buttholes. And then I eventually am going to collect enough work out of that and like put out a, a zine of just like this gross work that I made to keep myself and my girlfriend entertained, which I did do. But it allowed William Saunders and I to like work on the dead guy documentary, which we completed, which would have not happened in the time and cost as to which it did, which ended up being this weird time capsule of the transition of technology of five years ago, we wouldn't be sitting having this Zoom right on yep. podcast. You know, maybe it'd be over the phone or like whatever. Like that didn't ex- this didn't exist five years ago the way that it does now, where it's like I sit fucking through meetings, marketing meetings for the company I work for all goddamn day video chat. I don't even know in person like the people on my creative marketing team because we are all in different locations, which is awesome. What we did with the dead guy thing was utilize that turning point in technology. And we made this like weird time capsule about this band that like a lot of people didn't like and like kind of challenged what hardcore was in the 90s, which was awesome. So with the book, it was the kind of the same thing of like, with with the documentary and the book, it was like people were around and I had access to people that I might not have gotten a hold of. And me yep. taking this idea of gallery shows and then that not being an option physically of presenting and pitching the idea of like, what if we do like a book or like a zine? I was starting small. I was like, yeah, let's just do like a bunch of zines. Like I'm just sitting here. I'm fucking bored. I've got access to my work, obviously, my old roommate, Jay, like he and I were talking of like, let's just put our collections together. There are so many shows that I shot that he made posters for. Let's just pair them up. That quickly turned into like, well, maybe we could do like 150 pages, which then (laughs) turned into like 200 pages, which then turned into like 344 pages. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And it just as the more time I had, the more things came together which obviously got very complicated of getting a master list of like every band that's ever played there. Right. And like, what do you do with that? How do you cut that down? Which there's like thousands. Well, and you want to get blurbs from as many people as you can to add, because some might be better than others. And then you got to parse through them. And it's an undertaking, man, especially as much as is in there now. I mean, shit. I was. It's thorough. Super unreal. (laughs) unrealistic of like yeah man i could do this like six months eight months and you know here we are like three years later and it's finally on a boat coming from the czech republic (laughs) nice yeah Yeah. well the thing that you 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 asked like what i do for a living i am a project manager in in technology so like i i know what it takes to get things done and as i think about the steps involved it's like it's fucking massive because like 
yeah, you have the content. So you, you know, you have the photos. It's a good head start. But then it's, you know, curating all the, the interviews. Like, I mean, we can relate to that. Like, there's a lot that goes into mm -hmm. it. It's chasing people down. Hey, how can I, re you know, XYZ person, you know, the sure. list goes on. How many episodes have you guys done? 211 or 12 at this That's point. That's a fucking ton, dude. Yeah. Oh, dude, every, yeah. Week, every week for four plus years. We've not missed a week. I don't know how. Yeah, but... I don't know how. You know. <laughs> That's incredible. Like Weddings, that... kids, jobs. Pandemic, not pandemic. pandemic yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Like that's such a massive collection. And as somebody who consumes podcasts, all media, as we all do, I think you guys obviously know how much work this is for you for podcasts. I know 100%. now how much work, percent. work it is. To, like make a book, you know. But I don't know how much work a podcast is. Like I can, I, I can relate in terms of like things I've done that I'd be like, well, it probably takes this amount of time that that's a massive accomplishment for both of you. And you should be very proud of yourselves because that's huge, you know, Thank and you. to keep that going of regardless of what's going on, you know, not to turn around and make it back about me, but like you being a project manager, like, you know, the steps. I didn't know the steps cause I've never made a book. <laughs> it's like very unrealistic yeah. right, right. with, but you know what, Nathaniel? If if you knew the steps, you might not have, not might not have started. That's one hundred percent true. Yeah, yeah. You go dive in first, and then figure yeah. out the steps as and you go. Because that's, go. that's yeah. what we did with this. I mean, we mm -hmm. we had no fucking clue we would be doing this this long out and talking to people and uh, sure. you know getting digital advances of these gorgeous books. You know, like we had no idea that that was possible at all. You know, it's it's funny that you put it that way because I've been thinking about a handful of other paper projects of of my own work and i'm enthusiastic about it but i'm like is this is gonna take three years totally. yeah. now you know now you now know. know now i know and, and yeah. now you'll never do anything ever again no never that's gonna do lesson. anything again <laughs> no it, it like that journey in education of doing everything the wrong way and not knowing i think was one of it's the strength of the book and the weakness of the book even to the point of I ended up just taking over full design creative control and I had a couple layouts that were very juvenile and uh, Damien Moyle well, had been a really great resource of just me bouncing ideas off of and I'd sent him a, a, a version at some point and he called me and he was like, this thing is a fucking mess, dude. However... <laughs> Because you don't have a design style, because you are not a designer, your style is this mess. Yeah. And he's like, what I mean by that is like that bar is a mess in terms of there's flyers everywhere. There's ephemera. There's not, you know, like it's, it's a very well-designed bar. It's aesthetically pleasing, but like you go in the bathroom, there's stickers, there's graffiti and it's loud and it's chaotic. And like what you kind of did was present the book as the bar like what people see smell and hear in the bar is just being this like vomitory explosion of just shit and content and photos yeah. and posters and interviews and blah 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 yeah and i was like oh shit that's like kind of a really great point which i don't know it was necessarily my intent but as i mentioned style earlier with photos like the longer I worked on it, the more I kind of understood like, oh, this is kind of my aesthetic. Is this more magazine zine cut out taped together thing? Because that's what I always loved growing up looking at more than I loved growing up looking at Taskin books, even though I have a large collection of them and they're very beautiful, very thought out and, and simple. The design elements are great, but like, I don't, that's not what that bar is. It's chaos all the time whenever you walk in the doors. And I think that that element is very strong. I ended up bringing on um, Eric Palmerly, who, who became kind of like design editor, because he also recognized that <laughs> I was drowning and I kind of needed some help to finish it. And he really tightened it up and took kind of like my ideas and like made them actually presentable and, and, and more professional looking. But no different than like an album track listing, how it was presented from start to finish as far as like the chronology of events in, in the order of which 
bands are presented you know like i tried to stick as much to as like what the timeline was from 2011 to 2020 of it's pretty it's like 75 percent chronological untrue to like when things happened throughout the history of the bar which i mainly did because to me there was like no other way to like present it other than like is like literally as i could it wasn't like just like list all the shows alphabetically like that kind of made no sense to me and if i bought the book and it was presented that way i'd be like i can this makes no sense well i love i love the way you set the stage of it of like you there's the walter forward then there's you know kind of it gets into your kind of take on the whole bar and venue and then you get into the owners and you know dave on the booking side and then there's you know the flyers and you can get a sense of like okay because i feel like the flyers are kind of a tease of what's to yeah. come it's like oh shit like anthrax played there i didn't know that you know mm -hmm. blink Lane, what where was i you know nobody was at that <laughs> no yeah <laughs> there you go. i barely even got into that there's a science to it and then you executed it and there's so many just decisions of like what font to use and what placement sure. and it's almost like advertising like in a magazine you want to be on the right hand side like you want to that's where you add that's where the person draws their eyes and it's aesthetically pleasing for sure i gotta sure. get my hands on the physical thanks man i i appreciate your your feedback on that it like makes me feel like I, I did my job and i accomplished it you know, and the one thing that I kept thinking about was like, well, what would I want to look at? Because if I don't like it, why the fuck would anybody else like it? And frankly, I don't really give a shit what anybody else thinks because I'm making this kind of for me of here's what I thought was cool that I could get my hands on that happened in this place for like 10 years. And, and if I can't be proud of it, like, why would anybody else care, you know? Well, yeah, and, and you're able to use your work you were in it you lived it which is always a big piece of anything authentic when it comes to art i think if you're doing it and you're an outsider it becomes a little more difficult but if you you were there every day you know you're working there you were seeing bands there you're shooting bands there it feels like that when you look through the book you know what i mean like it's sure. it shows somebody this is kind of my love letter to this place that i've spent a ton of time at whether it be working or as a patron or whatever here it is for you guys to here come on in let me show you around that's sure. what it felt that's what it felt like to me yeah i i tried to as best as i could really make the book feel like you were in the bar which is i think one of the funniest things that i came up with to pat myself on the back was doing a two-page spread feature on the basement because the basement fucking sucks. It's gross. This is one of our favorite parts of the book. It's dirty. 100%. And every person that has ever played there has a story that is generally not favorable of that basement. However, there is also the comment of like, yeah, it's gross. And there's the piss pipe above it, above you that like, <laughs> there's weird drips and smells. What has happened down here? But at least there's a place to hang out. Because there's a lot of venues that size that don't have a space where like friends can run into each other, or bands can catch up with each other or or other people. And I feel like I tried to capture that as best as possible between taking pictures of it and getting some like really hilarious quotes of people's experiences down there. Because even though it's just a basement, like that basement has its own identity and personality that is like equally almost is like legendary as yeah. the life room oh, yeah. upstairs you know well this is gonna sound crazy i'm i'm a basement guy like when my wife and i went looking crazy. for houses yeah. like eight years or whatever it was the first i'd walk in the house i go right down to the basement it's like can i finish this off could i have basement shows here it's like all these yeah, opportunities sure. i'm in my basement right now like this is this is my sanctuary and so tony's not kidding like that's what <laughs> the part of the book I, like i just geeked out on was the fucking basement and i'm like and i'd never been down there i mean i went to the venue once but never went downstairs one question i had for you is was there ever any consideration to have bands play down there i don't know the size i don't know the logistics of it but like i know like cb's basement i went down there for a sense by man show years ago you know old rev band yeah and it was no, like what you'd expect of a 
fucking CB's basement show. Was there any, ever any thought to put bands down there? Ever since play? my man record was so good. I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah, have like a fast upstairs, downstairs, you know? Uh, I think that, I mean, you probably could get away with it in some facet, but like, it's pretty tight. Right on. Yeah. It's pretty tight. I, yeah, I don't, I'm sure I would say it's like statistically implausible that like that hadn't been suggested at some point <laughs> right in like the yeah. last decade. But um, I don't know, maybe some point but yeah any any venue where the basement is its own institution it's like yeah you, you get to dedicate yeah. a couple pages to it and i'm glad yeah. you did so who who looking back like as you're compiling this and you're you know reviewing all the photos you're selecting which ones which photos to put in any sets where you're like fuck i remember that set that was a fucking special set i think beyond just the vitus book whenever i go back and look through stuff there are fractured memories of things that like i absolutely don't remember and i have gotten to the age a little bit of i shot that band like for real i don't remember being at this at all and then i'll see a picture and it'll come back to me but with vitus that body of work specifically yeah there's a boatload that are like pretty magical events that have my non-camera memories of but having, you know, the souvenir of those photographs just like make those, those are like mine. Those are my memories, you know, that I could share, obviously. But that's kind of also like what's cool about the medium in general is like, yeah, man, you could watch a video or like we could even go to the same show. You were at that As Friends Rush show, you know, back in November, I shot that. If I show you a picture that I took of that show, is that going to be aligned with the memory you have of being at that, even though we we're in the same space? Maybe we weren't standing in the same area or we obviously didn't get, unfortunately, get to meet. It's like, what was your experience with talking to people? Like all of that stuff 10 years from now, 15 years, 30 years from now is going to like play with what those couple hours you spent in that building are going to be, you know, just so be able to like look back and be like, fuck, man, the descendants played right on yeah. yeah yeah like not only did the descendants play but like i was up front and i got like milo sweated on me and it was awesome <laughs> and they played all of my and mm -hmm. everybody else's favorite songs in this radical event that just very organically and spontaneously happened that shouldn't have happened and changed the course of the bar and like what they were able to like pull off which for those that like don't know the short version of that story is that they were playing the Brooklyn well, uh, Williamsburg waterfront it was like, I don't remember if it was like the riot fest brand, but they were playing at festivals like that. And Gorgo Bordello, the Bronx, uh, hot water music, the Bronx were playing and the beautiful August summer day. And this ghostbusters ass storm. Heck opens up the Ghostbusters trap and just all the spirits get loose. Just came in over Manhattan and the sky turned no. fucking black. Maddie gets on stage. Bronx are playing. He's like, here's your shitty future. They play shitty future. Fucking just sky opens up. They come out. They're like, show's done. Canceled. Tornado warnings. Damn. Thunderstorms. We run. And we're like, let's just go to Vitus. Where else would we go? We go. I was with Tucker. Rule thursday and we get over there and and they're like yeah the descendants in hot water are playing wow we're like what what are you talking about tucker actually reminded me of this when i interviewed him for the book he's like yeah man they pulled up in a pickup truck somebody had and we helped bill stevenson load his <laughs> drums in and i was wow. like what are you talking about he's like yeah man i was like i don't fucking remember that at all because we had already been drinking all day and i was like <laughs> yeah. for real that happened and he's like yeah and then Artie Shepard, one of the owners of the bar, was like, yeah, man, you guys, like, loaded in the Descendants for them. You were both very excited to do that. And I was like, I don't remember that at all. And within an hour, Hot Water was on stage, and there was, like, a line of kids that was, like, a mile long trying to get into that thing. And then the Descendants played, and it was, like, one of the most magic nights of... I almost didn't go to the show because the subways were fucked up, and I had to take, like, 15 buses and walk to get to this venue and I was just kind of like I have a photo pass I gotta go I think I was actually shooting for Rock Sound magazine 
and um it was a foray i was also writing like a review of the show so i was like i kind of have to go or i'm not going to get paid and then it just turned into like me writing what i also put in the book because like the article i wrote on top of my pictures and the editor just hitting me back and being like what the fuck did you just see and i was like <laughs> i don't know man i just happened to be there yeah, you know that was just yeah. like one of those lucky times i just happened to be there and um that event changed the course of that bar because overnight the coolest band that has been ripped off a million times played the smallest show that they've probably played in 30 years yeah, in yeah. front of a couple lucky nerds that just happened to make it there in time before capacity got filled you know so those types of memories of like fuck man i got to document that i got to shoot obituary one of my probably my favorite death metal band ever carcass my second favorite death metal band ever play these small rooms where they are not only playing to 250 like rabid fans but also have to walk through the same crowd to get up to the stage it's only one way everybody else there's only one way in one way out you know as phil anselmo regardless of how you feel about him quoted as saying you know like everybody's got to do the vitus dance to get to the stage you know <laughs> yep we're all you know we're all equals when we play here which again you can fuck if you like that guy or not the point of that room will destroy your ego if you have one dave mistake <laughs> who everybody has to walk through this crowd to get up there a lot of people don't like that a lot of people do like that. Everybody started playing venues that size. So if you're coming and you're agreeing to do this as a bigger band, like, you know what you're in for. And, and I think for a lot of people, it's like, man, this is a reminder of like where we started. That is awesome. Yeah. I got that from a lot of people. One of the coolest, there was a quote from uh, Raven from 1349. And he was like, we started playing in venues this size in Norway. And so to come back and they've played there a couple of times come back and play a room the size again just reminds us of where we started and and that's so humbling and like incredible that we have the opportunity or whatever however the fuck you said it to come back and like play those kinds of rooms and like i got a lot of comments interviewing people like that where they were like this just reminds us of where we started or this has just always kind of been a home because we started here you know there's a lot of bands broke out of that place locally in in and internationally, you know, like the Bell Witches and um, there's other ones <laughs> I can't think of at the moment. Uh, nothing. I mean, that band's fucking huge now. Deaf Heaven, who I think just signed a road run. You know, it's like those yeah. bands got like real early shows, opportunities like off of demos that, you know, the bar took a chance on like bringing them to town and throwing them on stage and like they just exploded. I don't know that I want to say that bar has like set a barometer of like cool in an industry standard, but like, I kind of think it has again with like people shooting, whether it's me or Frank's videos, like that's kind of like a, a, the exposure that people get by being in that room and have over the, over the years. Like obviously you have to just keep going back to the CBs comparison. Cause there hasn't been anything like CBs since CBs. I love that it's a home for people coming up and it's an underplay option for people that for whatever reason, like read, read, read the book. You'll find there's a number of different reasons how bands end up there. Sure. And for Tony and I, we like it all. Like look at our interview lists on our website of every band we've ever had on. Like there's a lot of bands that have played Vitus. Like, We've had mm -hmm. members of Killswitch, As Friends Russ, Thursday, Anthrax, Calling Hours, Incendiary, Frank Turner, you know, you name it. So if you, I mean, look at the range of that, of those bands. It's just crazy. And there's not a lot of bands, uh, not a lot of venues that can say that in a shorter period of time, 10 yeah. years. Frank Turner played there twice, including opening for Mineral. Oh, which big show. Mineral did their reunion, which I included in the book. And there's going to be a lot of people who say, what, what the fuck is Mineral Metal? He, when I interviewed him, was like, yeah, man, I was flying a friend of mine 
over like we flew over for the show because i never thought i'd get to see this band and like Artie was just like hey do you want to play like last minute and he got up and played it was like dude i got to open for my favorite band Damn. in this room and like people who like both of them didn't know he was playing and like people like lost their minds you know and in in as a project manager right what better marketing than internet hype so totally Yep. Who gives a shit how many tickets you actually sell as a band? You could sell out 1,500 cap room. Does that have the cool factor of you selling out Vitus? That's a great and point. And like the fandom of the world we live in of reposts and social media and like that hype machine that kind of can be built around like whoever you are, you might get more out of just playing this like small little 250 cap room than you would a bigger venue, which is cool. Let's uh let's jump into where we can get it. So uh, we'll put this in the show notes. But what where's the best way to find the book to get the book once this is all going on sale? When's it hitting stores? All that stuff. So right now we're looking at hopefully mid to late April to actually physically have them in hand. With the state of the bar right now, I don't exactly have a definite answer of what's happening. I know that we do have copies available through the St. Vitus Bar website. Uh, there's a handful left. We did a pre-order last summer, which is almost completely sold out, but we have a handful of copies left up there, and we are planning on doing some sort of release event. Uh, I will keep you guys posted of what that info is if you want to in include it and, and plug it. But for now, you can go to the, just Google St. Vitus Bar. I think it's stvitusbar.com. I don't know. I don't run the website. I just make books. <laughs> Fair. Uh, but that's the best place for now. And, you know, hopefully down the road, we can get get a, a second run of it going and, and keep the the perpetual hype going and get more copies in into the crazy maniac fans hands. And um, everybody can sit around and reminisce or get nostalgic for things that they weren't at. <laughs> right. Well, and we'll have you back, too, because, like, we scratched the surface. There's more here. <laughs> we could totally do this again about uh, this or, you know, just your time yeah, sure. being a photographer in the scene. So Awesome. Well, I, again, appreciate you guys giving me the uh, time to ramble at you. Hey, gorgeous book. And it, if, if anyone who is a regular listener for us, go check it out. It's well, I mean, I just named I just named it, uh, you know, what, maybe a tenth of the bands in the book. If you're like us that likes from mineral to carcass to anthrax to blink, I like it all. Go check out the book. We'll link it all in the show notes. So, Nathaniel, it's a pleasure, my friend. Yeah, thanks, guys. And we're friends now. Like, it's confirmed. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. We don't even need Damien. No, no, <laughs> no, more, no more shitty glue holding the internet together. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Davey and Moyle yeah he's fine <laughs> he's fine alright guys you. have a good night and thank you again thank you for listening to Patio Slave we are at Patio Slave on Twitter Instagram TikTok all of the places that you can find us on social media Facebook Patio Slave Podcast YouTube Patio Slave Podcast there email us at Patio Slave Podcast at gmail.com and hey if you want to become a supporter click on the link at the bottom of the episode and Give us a dollar, give us five bucks, it keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you. And is it Nathaniel? Yeah. Okay, because we have a third host. His He's name also is Nathaniel, Nathaniel. We call him Nate. But he goes by Nate. I, yeah. I have heard, I've listened, I'm familiar with your podcast. <laughs> oh, so nice. I'm familiar Thank with you. there being another one of us. <laughs> yeah, with he's this blessed, blessed name. We could have done two Tonys and two Nates, but I know, right? Two yeah. Nathaniels. Yeah. It would have been a fucking free for all. I don't know that I've ever, um, been documented with another one of me. Oh, right now. Next time you, when you come back, we'll have Nate join we us have too. A Nate off. We'll, we'll have a Nate off. We'll have a Tony off and a Nate off. It'll be great. <laughs>